get ready to see this movie, I want you to think about something. Where we were at up here in Dallas, in Fort Worth, it was one of the weirdest things that you'll see on a normal situation. You won't see it here in Nacogdoches like you did there. Matter of fact, when we first got there, there was drug deals going on right there on the corner as we were setting up and as we were getting ready. Uh, you saw people of all or makes, models, sizes, and shapes come into that place, and they all had differences and different needs. And the one thing that I loved about what happened is I saw a family group that came up there, and as close as they were, they got even closer by the end of that trip. So we did up a little movie, and at the end of the movie, I'm going to ask all the volunteers that went up there to please come up here up front with us, and Miss Brenda will be ministering this morning. So are y'all ready? If y'all kill the lights and play the movie, please. I have heard all the stories about Jesus How he made the lame to walk again I have heard about the woman at the well And how he wiped away all of her sin But you don't understand the things I've gone all the times I shook my fist up at the sky Cause my life is one continuous disaster And if there's one thing I could ask the Lord right now There's still hope for me After all that I've said and done Even though I went out of my way to hurt you Even though you know that I will try and run How can you ever forgive me When I cannot forgive myself for all the pain I've caused to everyone around me Lord, please tell me Is there still hope for me? Jesus says to come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Cause there's still hope for you After all that you have said and done Cause I want you to try to live your life without me And that's the thing that hurts me most of all Cause every sin you have committed I have died for Every pain that you have felt, I felt it too. And I will never leave you or forsake you. Child, I promise you, there's still hope for you. Yes, there.
Guys, if y'all would come on up front up here for all of y'all that went on the trip. Me and Brenda was talking before the service uh, this morning as we were going through everything. And one of the things that we said is, and we came back really messed up beyond all imagine. Because you don't know what a mission trip like this will do to you but also what it'll do for you. Because to be honest with you, Christianity is not sitting in a church building, sitting in a chair uh, with your fancy clothes, amen? Being a church is being in the middle of where they're at. Uh, We have offered the opportunity for everybody that wanted to be able to give testimonies for what was going on. And so uh, as anybody would like to come up to be able to share, the mic is open. Miss Brenda's got the microphone over there. Why don't y'all do me a favor, give these people a hand clap for going for (laughs) y'all's. Go ahead, Brenda. Anybody want to share? Hang on. Well, I'll just say that I had a great blessing. I mean, the homeless people were just as sweet and nice the ones I ran into. And uh, the first person I met was that was um, a homeless was Apples. He's a guy that he was telling me all about he's listening to Christian music. And then we talked a while. And then he says, I know you're old, but you sure do get around good. <laughs> I said, thank you. <laughs> so, of course, he didn't see me trip a couple of times before I walked over there. <laughs> so, uh, and then Birdie. Birdie just, she and I clicked. I mean, we hug. She's the one that was usually hugging me. And she introduced me to a, a lot of people, but most of them were in our group, <laughs> so they already knew me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, it was just a blessing. They really were sweet people, and I'd ask them if they knew Jesus, and, and most of them said yes, so, but we talked about Jesus anyway. And... Um, there, yeah, there was one guy that I really, I wanted to talk to him, but I was kind of, anyway, I talked to him for a minute, and he was telling about he knew Mary and uh, Jesus' his mother. And I said, well, do you know Jesus? He said, yeah, Mary gave birth to him. And I said, well, did you know that Jesus, and in, I started with the creation. I said, he created everything. And he he got mad about it. And so he told me, no, he didn't. Mary did it. And so I said, oh, I better go help some of those women over there. <laughs> so I, 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 I knew I was on safe ground. But anyway, I didn't want to make him any matter by mentioning that Jesus died for us, so anyway, um, it was great. It was great. The homeless were were good people, and Birdie, the one that really liked me, she quoted the um, 23rd Psalm to me twice, didn't miss a beat, and she also told me the um, Lord's Prayer twice. I mean, so they're really good people. they just gotten into hard times some way so we need a lot of prayer for them I just have to say it was a very amazing enriching time and I am, was humbled by it and it, I had never been in situations like that and it was really eye-opening um the the one thing that stood out to me was on the second day when we were in fort worth and my job was to pat to man the um help man the lemonade and cookie stand and the one thing that hit home to me about their sit their every one of them situation the most was a man that came up and got his lemonade and I asked him if he wanted a cookie and he said okay 
And I said, okay, well, what kind do you have? We have M&Ms, we have chocolate, we have chocolate chip, oatmeal. He said, I don't know. I said, well, what's your favorite? And he said, I don't know. I haven't had a cookie in years. So I gave him two. <laughs> That's what sticks with me. Sorry, he has to follow me. <laughs> um, well, there were several of us that drove, and uh, yeah. They left me a couple of times. They didn't like I wasn't going fast enough, I guess. But, yeah, Dallas, anyway, that was, that was, yeah, he's right behind me, beside me, behind me, beside me, in front of me. Anyway, <laughs> but I knew that was going to happen. Anyway, there was there were several of us that drove. I drove um, Salia Suburban, and um, anyway, it was that was a challenge. But besides that, the actual process and what we we got out of it um you know water we we take for granted some of the things that we have we have access to every day um, and we take that for granted and a bottle of water was like liquid gold um you know uh feeding them and seeing them actually eat and it didn't matter you know they were they were so happy to receive it we could have gave them a piece of bread and they were so happy to receive it and when you don't have much, you know, and you, and you get something, that, that means more than giving them money. I mean, it was just, they were just so excited to even have us there, to hear the word of God, to be a part of that, to get a, a couple of shirts and a pair of pants, to get a, a pair of socks or underwear. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing just to see how grateful they were just for those little things um, and I talked to several of of the people and um, you know you just listen to them and just to hear them say thank you just to hear them say do you have another do you have you know can I have another meal or you know they were just so receiving of us and for us you know we we went to be a blessing that's what we went to be for. But I, I know every one of these people right here will tell you, we were the ones that were blessed. We were the ones that got something out of it. And when you see you don't have much, you really appreciate what you do have. You know, you really, really do. When you have no shoes, I saw there was one lady, and I just have to tell you about this one lady. And seeing how it's fitting on Mother's Day. One little Asian woman. I didn't get to talk to her, but I wish I had. And I feel bad that I didn't because we were just so involved. She had a little patch over her eye. You all remember that lady? And I watched her, and she had all her bags on her, and and um, she was, you know, wearing. Most of them were wearing long sleeves. Um, and I saw her. And she was carrying her bags around, and I just watched her. And she always smiled. She always smiled. And I thought. For a moment, I thought she was a little older. That's somebody's mama. That's somebody's daughter. That's somebody's aunt. That's somebody. She's related to somebody. And I told my boys the same thing. That I hope and pray if I ever found myself in a position like that, that they would love me enough to not let me go homeless. And someone told me, well, sometimes they choose to be homeless. Sometimes they choose to live that way. And I understand that. But she touched me. And I never had to speak to her. But she touched me. And just watching her eat. And just watching her be thankful and grateful. I was the one that was blessed. I was the one that was blessed. I watched my son the first day. I only wanted to kill him every other minute. <laughs> and he knows that because I've already talked to him about it. Um, but that second day, I, talk, I took him because I wanted him to see what he has. 
and what they don't have. He need to learn that there's a blessing in what he has, right? The first day, he didn't see it as much as I saw it, right? But that second day, he stood up. He was grateful to serve these people. He worked hard, and I'm proud of you, son. And if you didn't get anything out of it, something's wrong. But, <laughs> but I did see him, and that's why I wanted to go. And that's why I wanted to bring him, because I wanted to see him that those that have very little are grateful for what they have. But those that have much, man, <laughs> nothing like it. Be thankful for the little things in your life. Be thankful for the water. So those people were very thankful for that. Yeah. That's what I got out of it. Yeah. Okay, see if I can get through this without crying. The day Stan said that they were going to do this, I knew I was going. We had a Bible study that we were doing every day after church, and I missed the last week of it because I needed to be there. I didn't get to be there Saturday. We had a wedding we had to go to Saturday. But Sunday, well, we got there Saturday afternoon, afternoon after the wedding. Sunday when we went, I talked with several of them, and... My, my heart just went out to him because you don't know how much you have, how much you're blessed until you see people that can carry what they have in a backpack, okay? And they don't know where their next meal's coming from. I've always wanted to go on a missions trip, not able to leave the country and do that, so... When he said this, I jumped at the chance. I, I can't wait to go back. And one guy in particular, his name was Andy. He had a dog named Ryder, uh, Raider. Because at eight weeks old, the dog was raiding sandwiches off of plates. <laughs> That's why they named him Raider. I remember it, Raider of the Lost Ark, but... <laughs> But he really touched my heart. He was not, he was, he didn't feel sorry for himself. He had no self-pity. He was just thankful. And as the day went, uh, he asked, he went up to get saved. Uh, toward the end of the day, I went to ask him, can I pray for you? I said, Andy, I have a question for you. He says, only if you'll answer my question first. I said, okay, what is it? He said, can I pray for you? I said, that was my question. So I let him go first, and it really, really touched my heart. Because he thanked me for being a friend, for caring about him, for Richard and I, and he prayed for our family. And... It just touched my heart so much. Of course, I turned around and prayed for him that he would find a home. And he was living on Panther Alley, I think is how he put it. I don't know if he was in a tent or just out in the open, him and a friend of his. But as we got through, he says, I see Jesus in your soul. And I just started bawling. Because that's what I asked for. That's all I got. Anybody else want to share? Hunter, go ahead. Guys, we had an opportunity this last weekend to go and see something that me and Richard got to talking about. We're, we're really not all that far from being there sometimes. We, we, so many times we get concerned about not having the, the newest iPhone or the newest truck or the newest this and that, and there are people that literally have nothing. They don't even have food. Um, 
And in the last 10 years, God is, has worked in me in still an empathy. Because when I grew up, I grew up thinking that anybody who didn't know how to grow their own food and uh, make good decisions, that was their fault. But the fact of the matter is, is most people are one bad decision away from something that alters their life completely. And it's not, it's not a major decision. So God was showing me em empathy, but he's also showing me humility because as a church, we see this building, and it's a, it's a really nice building, and we think that we should have more. But we saw a church happen under three small tents. Yeah. Yeah. And there was more church happen under them three small tents, feeding people and giving them clothes and bringing them to Jesus than we sometimes have in this great big old building in a year. So I want to challenge everybody to... If you see a need, if you see something that needs to happen, y'all y'all get out and, and, and get with it. There was a guy who had a shirt that said, the, the church is closed on Sunday, we're going out evangelizing or something like that. And, and it really hit me pretty hard because that's what, that's what we're called to do. So. Yeah. Hang on a second. I want to say something. Hunter's dad went with us, but he wasn't able to be here this morning. And Hunter's dad is a natural when it comes to stuff like that. I turned around, I looked over there, and he's talking about how he had to learn something. You learn from your mamas and your fathers, amen? And I looked over there, and there was his father down on his knees, and he had this one man that showed up with no socks, no shoes. And there he was cleaning his feet and putting a new pair of socks on his feet and giving him a pair of shoes. And I sat there, and I thought, now I understand Hunter and who he is, and why he's the way he is. Guys, let me tell you something. When you go up there and you see something like that happen without being told what to do, that's when you know that Jesus is in the house doing something. Amen? Amen. Honey, you came from good stock. I'm proud of you for everything you did. There was one other story I forgot to tell a minute ago, and Miss Judy didn't want to didn't want to talk about it, so I just wanted to share it. But it was it was pretty neat. There was this one guy, and, and it was it was kind of after we did finish the first day, and he was coming up, and I didn't know I didn't know what was going on other than I was standing there with Miss Judy, and this man came up, and he right to Miss Judy and started talking to her and he started talking about his relationship with his mom and his dad and and um you know how he reconciled with his mom and with his dad and over and over again he he just talked about um what he did and what they said and he just kept talking to Miss Judy and I kept going what is going on you know I didn't know well found out that he had already been up to her several times that day um and we came to the conclusion that she reminded him so much of his mother that he had to tell her happy mother's day over and over and over again and i thought wow she didn't have to say a word and that touched that man's heart she didn't have to do anything and he was just so he saw his mama in her we all see our mama in her, but he saw <laughs> he saw his mama in her, and if he got anything from that, he got the joy of, of remembering remembering his mom through Miss Judy. And um, I wanted to share that story because I, it touched me that I, I didn't even know that he had already been up to her four or five times and said the same thing to her: "Happy Mother's Day, ma'am. Happy Mother's Day, ma'am. Happy Mother's Day, ma'am." And she kept saying thank you. So it was a blessing. She was a blessing, and she didn't even know it. She's just standing there, and it touched his heart. So I just wanted to share that for her. Awesome. Anybody else? Kay, you ready? Um, I want to go last because I didn't want to, I, I'm a watcher, I observe things going on around me, and um, not in a weird way. 
<laughs> yeah, I just want to clarify. But, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to rob anybody else's story because I was just absorbing everybody's stories. And uh, one thing that, well, I guess on Saturday I um, was working the closed tent and I don't think they're here today, but uh, Rex's daughter and granddaughter, Reese and Coy, they could only be there that one day. And Reese was my little helper. She'd take clothes out and tell me what size, and I'd fold them. And she was just working hard. And then they gave her a job, because a lot of the people started asking for bags for their clothes. They started, so she'd, would you like a bag? Would you like a bag with a smile on her face? I mean, she was such a pro. And um, I just, they're not here for me to brag on her, but I'm sure Poppy will tell them. Um, but, you know, it's so awesome to see such a small child and she gets it. And then to see uh, Jonathan and, you know, uh, Trevin working, these young people that are getting it, that there's, something greater than them out there to serve. And um, did you want to talk about your experience? No. I want to let him share, because he had a really awesome encounter. Um, where we were, when we were first got there, we got around and we got in prayer. And Mr. John Stout, he turns and looks, and he tells us to look, and within 10 minutes of being there, we see a drug deal happen just across the street on the sidewalk. And this apartment complex, also across the street, was a well-known crack house. Where we were, he said, had the most, m the highest murders and crime rate for any zip code in all of Texas. And Texas is big. The people there didn't even have clothes. And they didn't have life in their eyes, and it was sad to see one man, Mr. Cecil. Mr. Cecil was missing a foot he lost in a car accident, was wrongly accused of a crime, and thrown in prison. And when he came out, he had nothing. But that man who's been living on the streets for 10 years now had life and joy in his eyes to see us come out there and help him. And that touched me that we, he had nothing and was happier and had no complaints. And some of us here complain from our day-to-day -day life and how rough it was. Me and Trevin have found things on the ground that we can't say in church. <laughs> we saw used and broken needles um, and just rough there, just the and the place where the refuge was at was an ex-drug den and murder house. And the fact that they could turn that around for God makes me think they could turn that crack house into it too. But we have no right to complain about how we live here when they didn't even have clothes and could celebrate God. Come on. Amen. Awesome. I know. I'm so was so proud of him and I think for me personally there's just a couple of things to watch the ladies and all all these ladies not everybody's be able to be here Miss Tina Crawford sat with a long time with the lady and um just had a very sad story in that cycle of you know abuse and drugs and boyfriends, you know, prostituting her and, you know, just such a sad story. And I got to pray with Pastor Shauna. She helps in the day, day operation with a young lady. And she was so sweet. But her boyfriend had become abusive and he was in jail. And she was trying to, you know, figure out what to do, whether to take him back, whether to you know what to do and I said and we told her no you don't find your completeness in a man and a man that truly loves you 
is not going to hurt you. And I got to tell her and share with her that, you know, no man's going to complete you. Your completeness is going to come in Jesus Christ. And that's what you need to focus on. And God's going to provide everything else. You don't need that man. You know, you, it's okay to be about yourself because you're never about yourself because the Lord is always with us. And Sunday, we had a young mother and a little girl about two or three come in and, you know, she just stole my heart. She was precious. And um, her hair was a little unkept, but um, somebody gave her a drink. She walked by the drink line, and she said, thank you. And I thought, you know, somebody living on the street can be thankful. And the kids that we see every day, not necessarily our own kids, but being a teacher, I see a lot of kids, and there's a lot of precious, awesome kids that are thankful but some of these kids that I see complain about their breakfast in the morning and throw things away, you know, I think, wow, you are provided for and you are educated. This little girl has nothing. And her mama might not have anything, but she's teaching her how to be thankful. And I just kind of passed by their table several times and I just saw a lostness maybe in her mom's eyes. I don't, I don't know what you would describe, but they just touch me. You know, you want to take them home and, you know, help them. And you can't take everybody home and help them, but um, they just kind of stole my heart. And um, thank you. One thing I, the Lord put on my heart, but he spoke it to me again when I was up there. I hope to make a lot more mission trips. And I've always had on my heart to write a book about people's stories, about just talking to these people and giving them an opportunity to tell their story because everybody has a story. And um, so I hope someday maybe when I retire in a few years, that I'll be able to do that. But that was just, that was on my heart. And for our church family, um, we went to dinner at the Ugly Heifer. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at Brian because he, you know, he tends to pick on Judy. And there was a sign, am I going to give away? Am I going to, if I say it? <laughs> There was a sign, uh, we're in, you know, into the kitchen, and it said uh, something like, stop, only heifers in here or something. And you told Miss Judy, well, Miss Judy, they're calling for you. You better go in there. <laughs> and I was thinking, Brian, <laughs> I am so glad I'm not sitting by you. I'm like, mm, I don't think I would have gone there. But we had a good time, and we got to laugh. But uh, as we were leaving, everybody else was loading in the car, and we were just saying our goodbyes to John and Rachel. And she gave us to me the highest compliment of our church family. And she said, you guys just know how to be the church. You know, they, they said, just find a place where you're comfortable and go work. And we did, and it was just a natural thing. And to me, for our church family, that was just the highest compliment, that we know how to go and be the church. And that's just, I don't know, that's your proud mama moment right there, you know? Because we were just being us. We were just sharing the love of Jesus within us. But to me, that was just the highest compliment. So, and we do want to go again. It was eye-opening. It was very eye-opening. But, you know, I think we need to see those things, like Brady said, to just see how blessed we are and to see that need and, and to know how we can maybe, every time we go up, do a little something or take a little something, clothes or shoes or whatever, to, um, to help their situation. So it was an awesome trip.
Does anybody else want to share? Um, if y'all want to have a seat, I know y'all are probably worn out. If you don't want to share, I'm going to share just a few minutes um, about my experience from it and what it did for me. I've got all these tissue up here because obviously don't zoom the camera in because my face is swollen up from crying. But um, this weekend, you know, God's been kind of, he's been speaking to my heart about outreach and things and just being appreciative of what we have and, and, and just getting away from materialism and things like that. And, um, but he completely wrecked my heart completely wrecked my heart last weekend. Um, Pastor Stan had mentioned to me last week before we went, he said, you know, we're going to be giving testimonies on Mother's Day, and um, do you want to go ahead since you'll be up there and just share with them? And I'm like, sure, you know, didn't really think about it. You know, I'm crazy enough that when somebody asks me to talk about the Lord, I just go, yeah, okay. I don't ever think about it. Um, but so I did, but I want to share just a few things before I kind of get into to what I feel like the Lord wanted me to tell. Um, and it's not going to be long. I won't keep y'all long. But um, one of the most beautiful things, I think, that really after the first day, you know, like they said, John gathered us all up before we got started, before we ever did anything, and he just was saying, hey, you know, don't wander off by yourself. This is the most dangerous um, neighborhood that you can be in. Don't wander off by yourself. Don't pick anything up. You know, like they said, we saw a drug deal go, you know, and you could see the drug pushers driving through. You knew who they were. You could tell who they were the whole time we were there. Um, but I didn't feel any fear. Like when he said that, some people might have gone, oh, Lord, we might need to get out of here. There was none of that because I knew we were there and we were going to see God move one way or the other. But the funny thing of it was, is that I thought we were going there to show them, but they showed us. They showed us. I have never experienced, and when I say never, I am 47 years old. I have never experienced the kindness that I experienced from the impoverished and homeless people that we went there to serve Saturday. Saturday especially. Saturday especially. They were the kindest most thankful people I have ever come in contact with. And Jonathan nailed it when he said, you know, we complain about some of the silliest things and worry about some of the silliest things. They were so thankful. They were so appreciative. They were trying to bless us instead of us blessing them. I mean, they'd chase us down. Y'all have a safe trip. Y'all please come back. Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't know if we'll, I mean, I'm sure we'll plan a big trip with a big group again, but Brian and I are going back. We're going to, I mean, any weekend we can get free, we're going. You don't have to have a big group. Runner's Refuge does it every Saturday in Dallas, every single Saturday. They are there. Rain, sleet, snow, shine, doesn't matter. They're there. Load up in your car and you go. Because as, many, as much as we can talk to you today, as much as we can talk to you and tell you our stories today, I can assure you, you won't even get it. The pictures don't even show. They don't even show it. So a few people that really touched our heart. Um, you saw in the picture me and Brian with Cecil. He's in the wheelchair. Jonathan had his picture. He was the most precious person I have ever met. That man was imprisoned for 27 years, wrongful imprisonment. Wrongful imprisonment for 27 years. He had the biggest smile on his face. He was the kindest person, somebody that could be so resentful and just feel like he got, you know, the wrong end of the deal. That man, he had had a car wreck. He had one of his limbs were missing. He didn't have a fit on one leg. He was crippled. He, Jonathan helped him wheel him over there to the church service. As soon as he heard the music and saw it setting up, he was out there. And that's one thing that really, really um, touched me. I had several of them that said, when we heard the music playing, we knew we had to get out there. One lady said, she said, I just live in an apartment over there. She has a lot of health issues. And she said, I just heard that music, and I knew I had to come out. I knew I had to just come praise the Lord because he had been so good to me. You know, and some of us sit in here, 
And we have a really hard time praising the Lord, and he has been so good. But they were coming out of these crack houses. They were coming out of tents. They were coming on Saturday, y'all, on Sunday. We pulled into that district in Fort Worth, and I'm going to tell you what, they were everywhere on the streets leaning against poles. They were covered up. I mean, it was you see it on the movies, but until you drive through there and you are looking face to face with these people, you just don't get it. They were thankful. They were praising the Lord. We had church. I'm going to tell you what, Sunday, that church, I'm going to that church in Fort Worth, that man that was preaching in their praise and worship. We had church in that place. They were praising the Lord. They were praising the Lord. They had just come in off the streets, and they were praising him. It was amazing. Just like they said, we went there to be a blessing to them. We went there to be a blessing to them. But, oh, my God, I was so much more blessed. I mean, the Lord has wrecked my heart, wrecked my heart over this. But I wanted to share just a couple of things um, we're probably not even going to get into the message that I prepared, and that's, that's okay. I'm perfectly fine with that because the Lord had his way today. I know this isn't your typical Mother's Day, so if you came here looking for a really great, wonderful Mother's Day um, message and you're disappointed, I'm really sorry, but go talk to the Lord about it. I'm not, I'm not going to say this is, I mean, this isn't a regular church service. We're not a regular church. So I'm going to say now, I'm thankful for the testimonies today because we need to hear it. We need to hear it because we need to get outside of these walls and we need to go out and do what's needed. And so I want to share a couple of things that I had written down that I was going to share in the um, testimony. But um, Disruptive Compassion, I'm going to tell you what, if you've never read that book, this is the book that I've been reading before... um, I went, but it's by Hal Donaldson um, with Convoy of Hope. He's the one that started Convoy of Hope. That book, whoo, I'm going to tell you what, it's good. So get it, but you better have your heart ready to have it disrupted because that, that is exactly what it is. And I'm so thankful the Lord prepared me. He had my heart prepared through that book before I ever went there this weekend, um, last weekend. And so one of the things he says, he says, the first and most important steps to accomplishing a mission are to recognize a need and accept responsibility for doing something about it. See, that's the thing. We may see a need a lot of times, but we don't take the responsibility to say, oh, I need to do something about that. We might not can do everything, but we can do something. It's not an excuse not to do nothing. And see, that's all we did this, this last week, and that's all we did. We went there to do something. We knew we couldn't do everything. But I'm going to tell you, just like they said, sitting back and watching, there was, there was a couple of times I kind of went from the closed tent to kind of just checking, you know, people to visit and talking on Saturday. And um, I had to remind myself to take pictures because I wanted you all to be able to see what was going on. Um, and so... But to watch our people just love it. I mean, you didn't even have to. If you're, if you're afraid to minister to somebody about Jesus Christ, you didn't even have to speak. You didn't even have to do that. You just had to be there and love them and listen to them. They all have a story, just like we have a story. They all have a story. And like they said, it could be one paycheck away from being there. You know, we struggle. I don't know about y'all, and I found myself, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to confess something, because we live in a, we live in a old farmhouse, is what I say it is, it's just a big old farmhouse, poor things, it needs a lot of work, and I find myself complaining, frequently, my husband would say (laughs) about it, (laughs) things that need to get done, but you know what, I found myself coming back to that home on Sunday, And I was so happy to see it, and I was so thankful for that. I don't care what is broken in that house, how terrible it looks, whatever, because that house has covered my family and my children for almost 13 years, and it's still standing, and it's still doing the same thing. But I found myself being so thankful and just realizing I don't need a lot of stuff. 
I don't need a lot of stuff. Mother Teresa said this, and this is in Disruptive Compassion. I'm sharing some of the stuff from that book because it's so good. But she said, everyone can do something. Everyone can do something. You don't have to give a lot. Let me tell you something, and I'm not going to preach on tithe because that's between you and the Lord. I'm going to tell you what. Both services, they had a bucket out there for the people that wanted to give unto the Lord that were there receiving food, receiving clothes because they don't have a whole lot of anything. People living on the streets, and those people went up there, and they put money in that bucket. They put money in that bucket. From their lack, they gave. And sometimes it's really hard for us to give from our abundance. And so I hope that encourages you to watch them go up there and put money in a bucket for an offering unto the Lord because they were thankful for what the Lord had given them. That's powerful, y'all. I don't know. That is, that is powerful and convicting, and I hope it touches and convicts your heart. And it said kindness is a lifestyle. We need, to, we need to adjust our lifestyles. You know, we worry a lot in this world about um, the appearance of a really great lifestyle. We live in our big houses, drive our big trucks and cars, and wear the right thing, carry the right purse, have the right phone, just like Jonathan said. And we need to take a look. I don't know about y'all, but me coming back, and the Lord had been working on me about this before I went, but coming back, I am not worried about no lifestyle or what anybody else thinks about the life that I have because I want to turn it around and I want to have a lifestyle of kindness so that when I see a need, I step in. And if I can't fulfill that need, I find a way for it to be fulfilled. We need to have a kindness as a lifestyle. And one thing I want to say, because when they were talking about, you know, a lot of times we have, um, I was going to talk about mother's love and how great all this was. Lord Jesus, he just done disrupted me today. So I had this whole thing planned about, you know, how wonderful mother's love is. But in truth, and I'm still going to get there. There's a love like no other. Mother's love is wonderful, but there's a love like no other, and that is the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ, okay? That is a love like no other. And you know what? There's a song um, when I was preparing for this that, that I had kept coming to my heart, and I just played over and over when I was preparing for this, and it's Matthew West's song, Me on Your Mind. I don't know if y'all have heard that song, but whew, if you have not heard it, y'all got to go listen to it. But this is one of my favorite parts. It says, who am I that the king of the world would give one single thought about my broken heart? Who am I that the God of all grace wipes the tears from my face and says, come as you are? You paid the price. You took the cross. You gave your life and you did it all with me on your mind. And let me tell you something. He didn't, he didn't do it for those that are all cleaned up and sitting in the church building today. He did it for those that are out on the street too. He did it for those that are broken. I'm going to tell you what, Saturday, it was the strangest thing. Hunter and I talked about this. We left there Saturday to go eat, you know, after we had served them. And so we were going to go eat and kind of just gather together. We literally crossed a bridge from underneath a bridge there are tents right there underneath that bridge, and we cross over into this ritzy little downtown area. Everybody's shopping. Everybody's happy. I mean, there were hundreds. We couldn't even drive through the streets. There were so many people just going on about life right next door. And, I mean, literally across the bridge, the worst area of Texas that you could be in, right next door. Hunter and I talked about that, and it was just, I mean, that was one of the first things we said when we saw each other once we got out of the vehicles. Like, did you see that? And we do it every day. We keep walking, going on about our lives every single day, and we miss those opportunities, just like those people are missing it. It's tragic. It makes my heart hurt. It makes my heart hurt. But the Lord died for them with with them on his mind, just like for us. Y'all have to go listen to that song if you, haven't, if you haven't. And if you think, you know, that's uncomfortable. You know, I don't know if I could really go do that. I loved so much the group that went with us. 
One, I loved that we kind of got away and we really got to get to know each other a little bit more too. But I, I'm going to say it was, it was just like Kay said, you know, that they had said that we, we just jumped in and served. I mean, it gave them an opportunity to kind of sit back and go, okay, and really kind of love on people and not have to worry about the details we, you know, and everything. But for them to say, y'all really got it. And, and Rachel told me that several times. She said, y'all really got it. You got it. You saw it. And I thought, how can you not? But we pass by it every day. Right here, every day. There's people here that need things. There's some in this church that need things. We just oblivious. I'm guilty. I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody. I'm guilty. But I don't want to be anymore. I want the Lord to reveal to me those things. So it's going to be com- uncomfortable. And one of the things it says on here is comfort zones minimize our impact by conditioning us to settle for less than the best. You know, some of those people that we served, they're comfortable in their, they're comfortable in their homelessness. They don't think there's anything any better. They don't even hope for it. They've got their own, they are a family group. I mean, they are a family, just like we're a family group here, they are a family group. I cannot tell you how many relations, I mean, they were just like, hey, and high five loving each other, and I mean, they are a family group. They protect each other. They watch after each other. I do want to share about Nakia on um, Sunday. Um, some of our ladies that were working, Salita, story completely wrecked me she I had uh, some of our other ladies had to step away and so I went to the table with Salita and she shared that story with me and I thought the simplest thing of a cookie not knowing what your favorite cookie is because you hadn't had one in so long it completely wrecked me but we were there and handing out cupcakes and cookies and drinks and um like they said everybody was so appreciative and this one young lady came up she was so pretty. It was a picture of me and her. She was a black young lady. Um, she had a wrap on her head. She, I mean, she, she could look just like me, really. I mean, she was just dressed nicely. She had on, and I complimented her earrings. She had these really cute earrings on, and I said, I like your earrings. She, I handed her a cupcake, and I said, I really like your earrings. And she said, thank you. And she had the most beautiful smile. And she said, um, she looked at me. She kind of hesitated for a second, and she said, can I talk to you just a minute? And I said, Sure. And so we stepped to the side, and she said, um, she told me her story a little bit, and she had been um, in prison. She went to prison for um, assault and battery with a deadly weapon. She said she had a lot of anger issues. Um, she said, but she looked at me, and she said, I'm not that person anymore. And I was like, that's right, you're not. And she said, um, she was upset because she had gotten a job. She got now was trying to get her life in order, and she had gotten a job. And a new corporation bought out the company she was working for, and she lost her job. And I could see in her eyes the fear of having to go back to that. And we had several people on Sunday, especially, that came in there that were dressed nice. Like, you would have never had a clue. We had, see, we have this... Um, this clouded view of what homelessness looks like or impoverished looks like. We can hide stuff really easy, if y'all haven't noticed that. We're real good at masking and and making ourselves appear more than we are, that we have more than we do. But she was so precious, and I got the opportunity to pray with her. And this was before the service started. And that service, I thought I loved so much that if y'all were here, here, last Sunday and listened to George and his message was on David and Goliath. Well, guess what? That's what our message was on, on Sunday too. You going to tell me God's not speaking in that? God's not speaking. And it was a powerful message. And the whole time I, I caught myself just doing this and every opportunity I got when I walked past her, I touched her because, and I told her afterwards, um, she actually ran me down afterwards before she left. And she came up to me and she said, I just pray you have a safe trip back home. And I said, well, thank you so much. And I said, did you hear that message? 
And she said, yes, ma'am. I said, that message was for you, wasn't it? And she said, it was. She said, I heard every word of it. And I said, I want you to hang on to that message, and I want you to know that God's favor is going to be on you, upon you, and he's going to open doors that nobody can shut. And you keep that faith. You keep that faith, and you know that you are changed because of Jesus Christ. And I asked her, I said, can I have my picture with you? I said, I want to put you on my prayer wall. And she took a picture with me, and she was so precious. She had just lost her job. She was getting her life right. Lost her job. She had nowhere else to go. Cecil is so precious from Saturday. I'm almost done, y'all, because I know it's 12. Almost 12. Cecil, um, Brian got to visit with him a lot more than I did. And I want to brag on my husband for just a minute. He's sitting back there looking at me, and he's probably thinking, Lord, help. What is she going to say? Um. Probably one of the most wonderful things that I experienced was watching my husband. Y'all know him as a little bit of a clown. He acts a little crazy even in church. Um, he is not right sometimes, but I'm going to tell you, that's the nicest way I could say it. My nephew's probably got his head down laughing over there because he ain't right either. But anyway, um, and they're really not right together. I'm going to call that out in church right now. Aaron Taylor. Anyway, um, my husband ministered. He was, he was ministering and loving on people. And it was a beautiful thing. There was one person that he was praying with that I, when I first looked up and I saw him from across the way. Um, and his name was Victor. And... Um, I snapped that picture, and I, I sent it to his girls on purpose. And I said, I want you to look at your precious daddy praying over this man. Because sometimes they don't get to see that side of them, you know. They're grown, not, not in our home anymore. But to watch my husband minister and love on those people was so powerful for me. Oh my gosh. And he had a gentleman that sought him out on Sunday. He would not talk to anybody else. He wanted Brian. <laughs> and they're like, he wants Brian. And Brian was busy giving socks. I mean, he was all over the place. And he's like, he wants Brian. He don't want to talk to him. And I was like, okay. You know, so I went and got my husband and he stood around there and told Brian his story. I don't know how long they stood over there. I bet it was 20 minutes or longer. I mean, I actually kept walking around there going, you know, are y'all okay? And, but he ministered. So let me tell you, anybody can do it. Jonathan did. I was so proud of those boys. Oh, my gosh. And Reese, Lord bless it. Oh, Birdie, she loved Gloria. Her mama's name was Gloria. And so she took up with Gloria. And she was telling everybody, my mama's name is Gloria. My mama's name is Gloria. And she was telling everybody how beautiful they were. And she just was so precious. But she bragged and bragged and bragged on Reese. And she asked Reese, she said, baby, how old are you? Reese said, I'm eight and a half. And I said, don't forget that half. And she said, she is doing a good job. That baby smiled at everybody, was handing out bags for their clothes, giving them socks. I mean, it was just a beautiful thing. Church does not happen in this building, y'all. It does not happen in this building. This is not what church is about. I love being here with y'all. But I'm going to tell you what. I don't think, I, I know that the bond that each of us have that went got way stronger as close as we are as a church family that was incredible so don't wait for the next big group trip that we plan if you have a free weekend you get in your car and you drive to dallas on a saturday morning 8 30 every saturday morning they start setting up they don't miss it and when you're standing there and they start that music and you start seeing people just coming from everywhere as soon as they hear it, they start coming. Same thing on Sunday in Fort Worth. They heard the music, and they just start pouring in from everywhere. Pouring in. Because they heard the music, and they knew, one, they were going to get fed. They were going to get loved on. And they were going to hear the Word of God. So I want to encourage you. I know this is not typical. I didn't even... Now I know why I told Pastor Shan. I said, you know, the Lord's wrecked me so so much 
from this trip that I struggled getting a message together for today. Because I wanted to honor moms, but I also wanted to tell you that there's a love like no other of Jesus Christ. And when our love is flawed, because our, mother, our, our hearts are flawed, I love my babies. I'm going to tell you what, and I'll do anything. They're grown, and I'll still I'll fight you tooth and nail for them. But my love is flawed. I failed my kids. I failed them before. Probably will again. But the love of Jesus Christ will never fail you. And the thing of it is, those people coming out and living that way, they knew it. We had so many that spoke the word of God to us. It was crazy. Birdie, she was preaching. I mean, she did not stop preaching the whole time. They know. There were so many of them that knew, even though they were having hard times, that they could depend on Jesus. They could depend on him. They trusted him. And the thing I'm going to tell you, and the Lord just put this on my heart, Runner's Refuge. We support a lot of missions here that are really awesome, and I know Soul Mission's always been a close one to my heart too, but whoo, Runner's Refuge, y'all, it's where it's at. They saw the need, and they are doing it. They need help. They need help, not only just volunteers, but they need financial help. They've lost some sponsors. Those of you that follow John, you know that he just mentioned that. And, and he needs about $3,500 a month. So he had mentioned that if they could get $35 a month consistently from about 100 people, that that would help them. And so I'm going to encourage you. Go, go to their website, look and see what they do, and if the Lord puts it on your heart, please support them. That is, that is a mission that we will be supporting outside of this church, even though the church supports them too. Brian and I are 100% in with this group. Our hearts were forever changed. Talking about Victor, my husband has worried about Victor. He prayed with Victor. This is my last thing, and I'm going to pray us out of here. He, he prayed with Victor. Victor said he wanted to get out of that neighborhood. <clears throat> he couldn't, you know, he, he, he just couldn't get away from the people. They were coming after him. Same people, he'd come back, go to rehab, come back. And so he wanted to, he wanted to get out. And so Brian went out of his way. He, he's like, let me connect you with John. What do we need to do to get him out of here? What do we need to do to get him out of here? And my, my husband has worried about Victor every single day. Every day. And I finally was able to reach out to Rachel yesterday and ask her, hey, did Victor, because he was supposed to go Tuesday, John was going to get with him and send him to, um, I think it was Teen Challenge, is that right? It's going to be a 12-month um, rehab and getting his life started and stuff. And Rachel had to tell me that Victor didn't show up or return John's call. And she said, you know, she said, sometimes they have to get to that point several times before they will be committed to go do it. But she said, keep praying for Victor. And I had to message my husband yesterday. He was working to let him know Victor didn't show up. But you know what? We're going to keep praying for Victor. We've got a new prayer partner with Cecil. We've exchanged um, addresses and I'm fixing to print his pictures out of me and Brian and him and then Jonathan and him. And I told him I was going to frame them and send them to him. He said, I'm going to put them by my bed and I'm going to pray for y'all every day. He said, I don't have a prayer partner. I need some prayer partners. So he's got new prayer partners in us. I know that. And I'm thankful to have him as a prayer partner. Because any man that can go through what he's been through and still have a smile on his face and praise the Lord, that's my kind of prayer partner that I want. So I know he'll be faithful to do that. Anyway, like I said, I'm sorry this wasn't a traditional message for anybody, but I wanted to let Kay share real quick. She had something from the Lord that she wanted to share, and then we'll close out with prayer. I guess I am the Mother's Day message because mine is related to moms. But one thing about Cecil, he was telling Jonathan his testimony. He said one night he was in a finally found an abandoned building where he could sleep and feel somewhat safe. And he said, Lord Jesus, if you get me out of here, I will serve you the rest of my life. And that next week, the Lord delivered him, you know, into a, you know, place to live. And, um, 
And one thing Jonathan told his dad is we need to do this more often. So to hear your teenage son say, hey, we need to do this more often, that was my Mother's Day gift. Amen. But um, the Lord, I, I don't talk about this very often, and I, you know, I don't get up here very often, but the Holy Spirit just has been telling me you have to talk about this. Um, for moms. But I used to not like Mother's Day. I wanted to go hide on Mother's Day, but I couldn't because I was on the worship team. Um, but our, I'm personally okay with not giving out roses to all the moms and giving all these things to moms because I was that person, and Stan's talked about having two miscarriages. I was that mom that, I was a mom, because I have two babies in heaven. I know that I was a mom, but you didn't have that baby there. And so the Lord just brought this back to my remembrance. I sang on the worship team, and I didn't want to let them down, because I'm a responsible person. But as soon as it ended, boy, I made a beeline for the bathroom, and I was staying there till after they passed out those roses, because I didn't want to be there and not be that mom. And that was, you know, that was my way. I just ran away. <laughs> and we had two boys that our best friend, Pam, they were our ushers in our wedding. And we were kind of like a second mom and dad. Their dad, they were awesome kids, and their dad chose not to be in, involved in their life. So she was part of our singles ministry. And uh, Stan and one of the guys, she ended up marrying Jack. Um, and some other guys, they mentored these boys. They, they were their dad. But I waited until I thought it was the coast was clear. And there one of them stood with a rose. And I said, dang, <laughs> I thought I missed it. But he said, I wanted you to have this rose because you're my mom too. You're my second mom. And we had two miscarriages and we had to decide are we gonna put ourselves out there and try one more time? And we decided to try that one more time. And, you know, he's sitting back there on the back wall. He's our rainbow baby, our miracle boy that we were blessed with. And by golly, he was born April 11th. And I know you're not supposed to take him out until they have all their vaccines, but we went to church. I said, I'll cover him up. I'm going to my first Mother's Day. I'm not going to miss that. You know, but... And then, of course, we adopted D-Ray. We always knew that we were going to have two kids. But, you know, after I had Jonathan, the doctor said, you can try again. But, you know, I was older when I had him and had some other health things come up. And we decided it would not be necessarily safe for me to try again. But we knew we were going to have two kids. And we didn't know how that was going to happen. And then, you know, a lot of you know our story about D-Ray. We ministered at the boys' ranch, and he was a boy there. He didn't talk much, you know, but you just, I guess the Lord just put him on my heart. And then we saw another kid from the boys' ranch on that, um, yeah, the window, the Wednesday night show where they showed the kids that could be adopted. So... The Lord hadn't put anything, unfortunately, on my heart for the kid they showed, but we looked and um, we had seen a video of D-Ray. And then a couple weeks later, we saw they did have him on the show. And we just said, okay, God, you know, we hear you. But, um, you know, long story short, he was almost 15 when he came to live at our house. We had <laughs> files of his records, and we knew it wasn't going to be easy. But, you know, God, over this last 10 years, 
um, has made him, you know, just really grow in our relationship. Because those first three years, it was like, hey, this wasn't what it was supposed to look like, you know, all the teenage angst and issues. Um, and we figured out, you know, it wasn't for us, it was for him. And it's still for him, but he's becoming that son that we, I guess, in our dream vision should look like. But um, I'm so thankful to have my two sons. And so proud to call them my sons. But I just, I don't know who that was for today. But I know that for some of us, for whatever reason, Mother's Day can be hard. Whether we've had miscarriages, whether we've lost moms, whether uh, you know we're not able to have the relationship we would like to have with our kids, it can be tough. But I just want to applaud each and every one of you for being here today. Because sometimes Mother's Day is like, oh, it's Mother's Day, it's wonderful, and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes it's not an easy day for us. So I applaud you. And if you need prayer, um, you know, I'm here after church. But I just felt, I don't know why, because I don't like to share. But God just told me to share that, to have faith and don't give up hope because his word says he will give you the desires of your heart and sometimes they don't come in the packages or the way that we think they would but God does fulfill the desires of our heart and that's what I wanted to share thanks awesome it's funny that she said that I didn't know what she was going to say but I did have a piece of that, recognizing the ones that it would be hard for. So God got his message across anyway. I just want to thank you all for being here. And like I said, if you're a little disappointed because it wasn't a traditional Mother's Day message, whatever that message would be, um, I'm going to say that it was. You're just looking at it the wrong way because today was about the love of Jesus and people actively walking in that, and that's what mamas do, most mamas anyway. And so anyway, I hope you were blessed by it. Um, if anybody has any questions about those senior gifts um, for the Azelway children in foster care, please get with me. Otherwise, I'm going to pray us out. Father God, Lord, I just thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the opportunity to be used by you, Father God, to be touched by you, Father God. I pray, Father God, that just as you've wrecked my heart, Lord, and so many of ours that went last weekend, Lord, I just pray that you touch every single heart in this building, Father God. I pray that you wreck their hearts. And I know that's a prayer that some people are scared to pray, but I'm going to say wreck them, Lord. Wreck them for you. Show us who you are, Father God. Help us to be more like you so that we can go out and show other people who you are, Father God, because this life is not about us. It's about you, Father, and it's about building your kingdom. And I just pray, Father God, today, whatever anybody walked in, I've been talking too long, Lord Jesus. We're going to go back into it. I rebuke you, enemy, in the name of Jesus, trying to interrupt us. Father God, we just thank you. I say, Father God, right now, Lord, that you touch every person that's in here. Father God, whatever they walked in here with, whatever they carried that was a burden in here, if they came in here, like Kay said, just to show up for somebody else, but their heart really wasn't in it. Father, I pray that their heart was touched today. I pray that they have joy in their heart and that they have your love in their heart, Father God. Anyone that's here that doesn't know you, Father, that today maybe they think, oh, maybe I am good enough for the Lord to love me and to care about me. I'm here to say, yes, he is. And I say, Father God, touch their heart. Let them grab somebody to pray with them, Father God. Don't let them walk out of this building, Lord, without giving their lives to you, Father God, and trusting in you because you are so good and you are so faithful, Father. I pray that you'll go with each one of us as we go about our business, Lord. I'm thankful today that I get to spend the day with family. And so I ask that each one of us as we go about and do our business, Father, that you're there with us, that you're there in the midst of it, Father God. But I ask that you open our eyes to the needs that are around us, Lord, 
Don't let us walk past it anymore. Don't let us be going on about our life, Father God, and be oblivious to a need that is right next door to us, Father. Open our eyes. Give us eyes to see, Father God. Wreck our hearts, Lord. I give you permission to wreck our hearts, Father God. Move in a mighty way in each of our lives. Protect each one of us as we travel, Father God. And for our missing um, people that are not here today, Father, I ask that you bless them, that you have joy in their heart and your love is, is shown to them today, Father God. Lord, we give you all the glory and honor and praise for today, Father God, because none of the stuff we talked about today had anything to do with us. It was all about you, Lord, and I thank you for that. I thank you for allowing us to be vessels and to be a part of your work, Father. May you get the glory for all things, Lord. You are so glorious, and you are worthy of our praise. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And it's in the mighty and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Blessings to all of y'all. Happy Mother's Day.